Michael. So uh, last but definitely not least, we have Dan Miller from Level Therapy. Uh, Dan's going to be talking about designing for situations where there's stigma. Uh, Dan is the founder and CEO of a company called Level Therapy that uh, basically provides in innovative healthcare for people with mental uh, health issues and things like that. Um, we're uh, we're happy to have you here, Dan. So, Thanks. yeah. All right, hello everyone. I know we're uh, almost at the end here, so I'll make sure to make this uh, short and sweet. Um, thank you for the intro, Joe. My name is Dan Miller. Um, I am the founder and uh, former CEO of Level Therapy. Um, and so Level Therapy is a, a mental fitness platform that provides video access to licensed psychotherapists, um, but also uh, we built products to help individuals manage anxiety and depression on their own. And so through um, actually building that product and scaling it um, across the nation, um, we learn how to uh, design for stigma. And stigma is obviously a huge portion of um, addressing individuals with, with mental health um, or mental illness issues in, in the United States. And so um, uh, going through this process for a second time, I wanted to figure out if there was a framework that we could create to explore these ideas um, and create amazing experiences. And so I'm gonna explain a little bit about that process today. Um, a little bit about my story. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work for some amazing companies here in the Bay and in various research, product, um, and design functions. Um, and so uh, my co-founder and I, we came together about two years ago. Um, she's a licensed psychotherapist. Um, and so I was experiencing um, a decent amount of anxiety after running a first startup that wasn't working out so well. And so I was transitioning to become a caretaker for a family member. Um, and for the first time in my life, I was experiencing uh, a lot of anxiety. Uh, enough so much that I, I wanted to actually uh, go for and uh, speak to a therapist for the first time in my life. And so that process led me to figure out how, um, how much friction there actually is in finding a therapist um, and how terrible that process is, not only for patients, but also for uh, clinicians on the other end of the marketplace. Um, and so, um, through that process, we developed Level Therapy, but I wanted to talk a little bit about this framework that um, I've been exploring, and I'm calling it rare, but um, uh, these four notions of, of how to reframe a problem, um, how to architect, architect innovation, um, obviously why research is, is very, very important. We heard a little bit more about that uh, earlier tonight, um, and why focusing on the experience, um, or rather designing from a place of, of experiencing the actual problem is, is really, really relevant for these communities uh, where stigma is inherently a part of their process or part of their experience. Cool, so I want to talk a little bit about the, the framing effect. Um, and so the framing effect is an example um, of cognitive bias, right? Um, in which people react differently depending on how something is presented. Um, and so it's, it's very, very obvious in, in the visual uh, representation, right? And so this is just the exact opposite of what you were just looking at, but um, you can let me know if you feel different or, or think differently about looking at these different text blocks, right? Um, but more abstractly, um, within experience, um, it's super, super important to, to frame um, a, a solution for these communities that are stigmatized uh, in a different way to gain access. Right, so typically these communities um, are already experiencing stigma either in the offline model or um, using online solutions. Uh, and so we found that actually addressing the solution um, by talking about it differently um, allowed us to gain a lot of access. Um, and for these communities, um, that's extremely important because uh, typically they uh, have not had access to, to uh, these solutions before. Uh, and, and a great um, example that currently exists in the marketplace is an, an app called Clue. And so Clue is um, an app that uh, allows women to um, track their period and ovulation uh, cycles. And so uh, this team is based in Berlin, uh, and the CEO and founder is, uh, is very adamant on making sure that uh, it's communicated that this is not just a, a problem for women, but this is a global problem for, for all individuals and that uh, she reframes this solution as something that 
um, make sure that uh, women in this case, um, but anybody that uh, is involved with the women, so men can obviously get on the app as well. Um, so they learn more about what's happening in their bodies and when anyone has more access and information about what's happening in their bodies, they can make smarter and empowered decisions. Uh, so I wanted to talk about a couple of methods um, that are, are really relevant when you're going through this reframing process. Um, so I'm not going to read through all of these, um, but uh, I'm happy to email the, these slides to, to anyone afterwards. Um, but a couple of these design um, uh, exercises that, that we used, um, particularly were uh, online ethnography um, and designing by metaphor. Um, so it's particularly designing by metaphor I think is my favorite because it really forces um, the team or the designer to really think through an entirely different lens um, that's different from uh, the lens that, that the problem is actually um, currently existing in. Uh, there's also some resources here. Um, these are actual books, and so if anyone wants to learn a little bit more about any of these uh, exercises, feel free to um, uh, check them out. Um, so next I want to talk about architecting innovation. And so architecture innovation is innovation um, that comes about by assembling um, existing components of a system or reassembling uh, existing components of a system. Um, and so this is uh, different from component innovation uh, where we're completely rethinking a system and, and completely trying to uh, understand how to create things that don't exist um, to, to address a problem. Um, this is more thinking about the components that do exist, um, how to tweak them just a little bit differently to make the experience uh, more enjoyable. And so the, the best example of this um, that I could think of um, uh, was the, the first generation of the iPhone. And so on the right here, we see a Forbes cover um, that was printed in November of 2007, um, shortly after uh, the original iPhone launched, um, kind of uh, boldly stamping uh, or stating that uh, Nokia is set to be the, uh, the leader for, for telecommunications into the future. And so like, we all know what happened here, right? <laughs> um, but the question is why? And, and uh, you know, there, there are a lot of answers to that, um, a couple. Like, so not just a, a reassembling of the components, um, but Apple also went a different direction um, in, in working with a, um, a service provider that was being neglected, that didn't actually at the, 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 in 2007, didn't have great service nationwide at all. But uh, the main focus was that uh, the team uh, decided to focus on the components that currently existed within the system um, and design them in a completely different way and put users at the center of that process and make sure that it was enjoyable. Um, and they took it a step further and completely talked about marketing the phone in a completely different way. Um, and so it was less about, you know, the phone being a, a utility that you use to, to communicate or, or use email, but it was at the center of your life and how you increase value in your life across a, a multitude of functions. So whether that is um, how you listen to music or actually stay in touch with loved ones, um, et cetera, including the apps or the ecosystem for individuals to create apps um, because they knew that they weren't going to be able to continue to build all of these different use cases that, that consumers were going to have. Um, so here are some, some methods um, when thinking about how to, um, uh, to address how to architect um, innovation. And so one of my favorite is uh, the co-design workshop. And so within my last company, this was something that was super uh, impactful for us. And so from the very beginning, we, uh, we brought in users um, to include them in the design process. And so uh, not just individuals that uh, let us know that they were um, experiencing um, a, di a diagnosable mental health disorder, but also individuals that had no idea uh, what we were talking about. They were um, just not interested at all within any kind of uh, app relating mental health. And this was extremely valuable for us to gain learnings into um, how to create something that's within the sweet spot for, for all potential users, um, because we know that 20% of, of individuals every year um, experience a diagnosable mental health disorder. Uh, so next I want to talk about things that uh, largely a lot of you in this room already know are extremely important, um, but I want to continue to, to reiterate them because um, 
I, I travel around and I, I still see um, a lot of companies and teams just neglect um, this portion of the process. Um, and it's extremely dangerous because uh, particularly within this use case for communities that are uh, very stigmatized, there's very little margin for error, um, particularly within uh, digital health. And so when we're talking about individuals that um, uh, have mental health disorders um, and they may be in crises, you don't have much margin for error when you're creating an experience um, that may, may uh, produce a negative outcome. And so for us, we, we recognize that and we put a lot of emphasis on researching how to create an amazing experience and making sure that for individuals that may be in crisis that we weren't letting them know that we weren't the right solution for them, um, but also creating an amazing experience where they could always reach out to anyone 24 seven um, to make sure that they uh, actually got a response. Um, so when I say research, um, I'm not just talking about uh, you know, traditional uh, quantitative and qualitative research. We know the value there. But I'm talking about making sure that we are all um, agreeing that we, are, that we need to rigorously test all of our assumptions, not just at the very beginning of the design process, but continuously. And so whether or not um, we're rolling out new features um, or we're launching into new markets or all of a sudden we're seeing tons of growth um, and there may be a decent amount of growth with, with potential users that weren't in our ideal um, use case that we didn't test for originally. Uh, we need to keep, make sure that we, we think about these things so that we continue to test these assumptions. Um, and so, so it's an example of uh, us using a service called Lookback, which um, I highly recommend, which is incredible. And this is a, a friend of mine, um, which I mentioned earlier, we, we made sure that we uh, were researching um, and testing all of our assumptions aggressively um, from the very beginning. And so uh, this was um, an example of uh, us using Lookback. And Lookback is a service where um, you send out uh, a beta to um, a group of users. Uh, the camera's turned on um, on their phone, uh, but the, the light isn't. Um, and so, I mean, we tell them that we're recording them, obviously. <laughs> um, but uh, they're not notified that the camera is on, so they, they, they forget that they're actually being recorded. And we ask them to talk through what they're thinking uh, when they're actually using the product. Uh, and so we were able to gain a, a lot of qualitative uh, data, but also quantitative data at the same time, because we could see what they were actually clicking on, um, you know, where their, their heat maps were on their screen, but also what they were thinking throughout that process. Um, here are a couple methods. Um, the one that uh, I just explained is the, the Think Out Loud protocol, um, which I mentioned was extremely valuable for us. Um, and, and you know, in a digital um, uh, application, look back as a, a really, really valuable resource. Lastly, the experience. Um, and, and so, I, again, I want to really, really harp on this because too often, um, you know, myself included, we, we tend to feel like we have enough of, of an understanding of the problem that we're addressing. So we start trying to design solutions in an ivory tower without really getting firsthand experience. And so whether that is being able to experience the problem or the solution that we're trying to create ourselves um, or getting in touch with communities um, that have that firsthand experience. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, for stigmatized communities, uh, the stakes are, are really, really high. And so um, this is something that is, that is really important that we get away from our computers and get out in front of individuals um, and talk to them and get into the actual shoes of the individuals that we're designing solutions for. Uh, so this is my co-founder. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, she is a licensed psychotherapist. And so um, we both experience the problems that exist and all the friction that exists within the, the mental health um, dynamic when you're trying to find a therapist on both sides of the market. And so when I reached out to her, I let her know, hey, I had this terrible experience. Instead of going back and booking a second session, I'm interested in building something that is better than everything that, that exists. Um, and so we talked a lot about the problems that she was experiencing as well. Um, and so for clinicians, they don't have the tools to, to manage any of the bookkeeping or the kind of insurance um, uh, overhead that exists. Um, they, they're not trained um, in any kind of business um, administration, so they don't know how to go out and, um, and find a space. They don't want to pay for that overhead as well, uh, nor do they really know how to market their business and find new patients. 
And so with us having uh, this understanding of both sides, both sides of the market, we were able to start um, designing a solution that uh, addressed both communities really, really well. Um, and we continue to talk to therapists um, and also talk to patients while we continue to design uh, the product. Um, and this was about a year and a half ago. Um, and it's allowed us to, to grow very, very quickly, but also um, have uh, much less churn that exists offline or on any of the other platforms that currently exist online. Uh, and here's some of the methods that, uh, that we used. Um, one of the continual mef methods that we used um, was the, the role-playing method. And so uh, for all employees and, and contractors that, that we ended up working with, um, we had them go through a role-playing exercise um, where they actually um, act like they're in, in a, a therapy office um, and then sit in a mock session for a little bit and think about uh, and get exposure into how awkward that experience can be. Um, and how difficult that can be when you're not in um, you know, a particularly great place. Um, and so they have some experience in, into the problems that we're designing for. Um, and so that's it. Um, I'd love to hear feedback. So if you guys have any, please feel free to reach out.